Think Forward. Think Research Channel. There's a structural problem with genocide, which is that it tends to happen in places that are off the beaten path. So now, in order to promote nonviolence and reduce violence, ultimately we have to address the motivation. Society needs to acknowledge that learning is a lifelong challenge. The sit-ins challenge cherished beliefs most whites held dearly. At the DNA level, we're all 99.9% .9 the same. All of us. So individuals do matter. And I think the quality of our individual leadership matters. Who is speaking for poor people? 40 million Americans make $6 an hour. Who is speaking for them? The only thing that one has after throwing everything overboard is the love that one can give. We expect schools to transmit from one generation to the next the knowledge, the values, the mores, the institutions, the belief system from one generation to the next. No other public entity is so charged. There are entities that do parts of those things, some but not others, but there is no other public entity charged by this society of literally perpetuating itself. Now, if you add to those two things what Chauncey Veach said about teaching, he is the 2002 National Teacher of the Year. And Chauncey uh, is a retired, highly decorated colonel from the Army. And after he completed his military duties, he was looking for some other way to serve his country, and he decided he wanted to teach. This highly decorated retired serviceman says that teaching is one of the highest forms of patriotism. So as you put all three of those things together, you get really some sense of just how important this business teaching and learning is. For a moment, I want you to imagine with me the possibilities of schooling. And I want you to imagine a school where every teacher is knowledgeable of and skilled in producing instructional strategies that ensure intellectual development and conceptual understanding in each student. Further, imagine a school district where every principal, PAL, is knowledgeable of and skilled in instructional leadership that leads to the removal of barriers to teacher success and improve student learning outcomes. Further, imagine a state where every local superintendent is an instructional leader who establishes the environment 
creates the resources so that every principal is successful and every teacher is successful. And further, imagine a nation where each and every state level educational leadership has the capacity to improve schools so that every teacher, student, and administrator enjoys intellectual development and success. If this imaginary picture and when this imaginary picture becomes reality, we will, in fact, have realized the dream behind No Child Left Behind. I am very optimistic about the potential for education in this country because we know how to do these things. No Child encourages rigor and accountability. It's not the first effort to do that. There were some states already along that journey. But it is the first effort on a national scale to focus on rigor for all and accountability for achieving the rigorous standards. When you look at National Assessment of Education Progress data, one sees an encouraging picture. No Child Left Behind is working. Let me give you just a couple of examples. In the latest No Child report, scores continue to improve across the board in mathematics. Overall fourth grade reading scores matched an all-time high. For African-American fourth graders, there was a posting of the highest reading and math scores in the history of the test. For Hispanic fourth graders, there was the highest math reading and scores ever. For African-American eighth graders, they had their best math scores in history. Same applies to Hispanic students. The achievement gap between black and white students is at its narrowest since 1990. The achievement gap between white and Hispanic students in reading is the lowest since 1998. More progress has been made between 2000 and 2005, that's up six points, than from 1992 to 2000, which went down four points. And it's about as much progress in math between 2000 and 2005, up 12 points, as between 1990 and 2000, that 10 year span. So in about half the time, there was essentially the same amount of growth. That's an encouraging picture, but more needs to be done. The picture is very positive, very rosy in some circumstances. It's not a perfect picture. Middle school performance, it's up marginally, but not as impressive as it needs to be. High school performance is static, and in some cases, actually, getting worse. So we've got our challenges when it comes to student learning outcomes. When we look at student learning of American students compared it to students in the other industrialized countries, those that take part in TIMS and PISA, you see a similar picture. First of all, we're about in the middle of the pack. In other words, mediocre in most cases. We look pretty good at the elementary level and not good at all at middle and, and high schools. So 
We have work to do. What to do? Well, do what works. What do we know about schooling that can be instructive as we work through the problems that have been identified on both NAEP scores and international measures? When I think about the issue of schooling, I group things in the four categories. These are what I call factors that, that impact on school learning outcomes. There are schooling factors, there are family factors, there are community factors, and there are factors that deal with the individual. Of those four sets of factors, schools have control of what? Only one set. The bureaucracy of education controls schooling factors. Now, we can impact on the other factors, but we only control the schooling factors. The nature of the curriculum, how rigorous it is, uh, how integrated it is, how aligned to other important things the curriculum is. We control those things. So if the curriculum is not appropriately rigorous and relevant, there's nobody else to blame. We, we have to take that responsibility. We control the quality of teaching. Who gets in, what they know, and what they can do. The bureaucracy controls that, or can and should. We control assessments, what we know about kids, and how we use the information from those assessments. All that good stuff the bureaucracy controls. We don't control family factors. Parents send us their best kids. They send us the only kids they have. But we can, in fact, impact on family factors to some extent. For example, we can make sure that the custodial adults in the child's life know the importance of talk, particularly for young kids. The nature of talk that goes on in the home, particularly preschool kids, is really important. And there's a whole body of research that talks about that. Whether it's negative talk or positive talk and, and, and the nature of that, how often the conversation occur. Really important things to help develop language skills. But beyond that, we can help parents understand the importance of questioning the child once the child comes home from school. An example, what did you do at school today? Now, those of you who are parents probably have asked that question. And a lot of times you get, I don't know, or you get, not much. Okay? But it goes beyond that. Explain what you did. Level. Tell me about it. Slightly different level. There's an old adage that um, you learn things twice, once when it's taught to you and the second time when you teach it to somebody else. Well, think about the mental processes that, that occur when a child is actually trying to conceptualize, how do I say this? How do I explain this? It requires the ability to analyze, evaluate, synthesize, and articulate. There are parents who say, well, you know, I can't help my kid with algebra. I don't know any algebra. That may be true. 
but simply asking the right kinds of questions can help generate in that child a more significant learning experience. Setting aside dedicated time for, for school activities and homework is real important. There have been all sorts of studies to link the amount of TV watching and student grades and test scores and all that. And you know, we, we in the education uh, arena tell parents those things and, and in some cases they resonate with parents and in other cases they don't. But when we can give parents some very specific things that they can do, it tends to personalize it and make it more, more doable. What about community? What are the community <coughs> factors? And I, again, I won't try to portray all of, of those factors, but let me give you a little personal history. I know that better than anything else. I grew up in uh, Salisbury, North Carolina. And I didn't realize it at the time, only upon reflection did I realize just how significant the community was in helping to create the ambiance, as it were, the climate in the community. Uh, I actually attended the, my alma mater is Livingstone College, which is a historically black school in, in Salisbury. Well, there's a Catawba College, historically white school, in, in, in that city. In the early 60s, the mid 60s, those two colleges had kind of an exchange program going on. It was not widely done across the country. I remember as a young child, college teachers, college students coming over to my schools and interacting with us by way of sometimes programs, dramatic or choral band presentations, sometimes giving lectures. Those kinds of things have tremendous long-term implications. Another example, what are civic and fraternal and even religious organizations doing or not doing to foster public schools? Again, while the bureaucracy doesn't control those things, the bureaucracy can certainly influence. And that final set of factors, the, the individual factors. In one sense, we probably have less control over that than others. But in another sense, if we can unlock the key, we probably can do more to help improve learning outcomes for boys and girls than anything else. I was an assistant superintendent in a little place called Johnston, S-T-O-N, County Schools, which is right outside Raleigh, North Carolina. Well, after I left that job to, to go work at the State Department again, I got invited back. It was February, and I was, going to, I was the Black History Month speaker. I long for the day that there's no need for a Black History Month. That it's all throughout the year, but that's another story. So I, I went back to this middle school, and uh, I was talking about how to plan for your future and things like that. And I noticed that in the very back, there was a group of young males, um, about four or five, and uh, the leader had on a cap. Now, how do I know he was a leader? because he was in the middle of everybody else. All the other folk kind of crowded around him. And uh, you could tell by the look on his face and his, his posse's face that, uh, that they would have rather been anyplace else, but they had to be there. And so they weren't really attentive, but just enough that uh, they didn't get in trouble. And Somebody would have him move his hat, and when they would go away, he'd put his cap back on. And, uh, yeah, you know, this is middle school, remember. And I started talking about if you want better results from your schooling experience, make the teacher teach you. 
And I saw this guy sit up straight and lean forward. Now, I caught his attention because that notion intrigued him. You're gonna make, how, how am I going to make somebody teach me? And so I started talking about how what teachers do really matter and, and all of that. But then I said, the way to, to make the teacher teach you is to ask questions. And if you're going to ask questions, what do you have to do? And one little enterprising student in the front said, well, you know, you got to prepare, you got to read. And so we had a little conversation about that. We ended up talking about the power of the individual in controlling his or her own destiny. And when my little friend in the back, who had the hat on but didn't have it on anymore, started paying attention, his friends paid attention, and he, actually he came up to me afterwards and wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Now, I mean, I, I don't have any greater wisdom than anybody else. I just happened to look up on something that caught his attention. But my sense is, he bought into the notion that, hey, maybe I can control some of this, that it's not all in somebody else's hands. You, you know there's some research that indicates, particularly for African-American students, uh, when surveyed about what is the, the factor most likely to determine your schooling success, of all students, the ones who say the teacher more than any other factor are African-American students. That's a pretty heavy weight for teachers. But it's a welcome weight and a doable weight. The kids got to bring something to the table, but we can help even with that in helping to, to shape some of what, what goes on in schools. So we've got schooling factors, family factors, community factors, and individual factors. Just focusing on those schooling factors, what are some of the things that can be done? I talked a little bit about them, but I want to speak a little bit more. I group those sets of factors into what I call macro and micro. In other words, large scale kinds of things and, and smaller or more discrete things. What are the laws, what are the policies that govern schools? Those are examples of, of macro level things. Is there rigorous curriculum standards? Partially due to no child, largely due to no child. More and more states have adopted more rigorous curriculum content standards. The federal government does not direct, dictate curriculum standards. We encourage rigorous standards for all, but it's a state's responsibility and in some places even a local responsibility to, to develop those curriculum standards. But that's an example of a macro level strategy. What about at the micro level? those specific behaviors that folk who toil in the classroom and in the school building actually demonstrate that are related to improved learning outcomes for kids. When I was a grad student working on a master's degree, ran across some research by a guy named Ned Flanders and his grad students at Michigan State. And they did one of the, I think maybe even a seminal work on student-teacher interaction analysis. They actually went into classrooms and observed what teachers were doing. And they found some interesting things. This whole notion of, of uh, talk time, how much talk various individuals in, in classrooms do, and the notion of wait time, all those things. Well, those things, uh, I think, were generated, at least in part, by 
what Flanders and, and his grad students did. But it was interesting that um, based on teacher perception of student ability, there was differential interaction. There was a difference in both quantity and quality of interaction. The whole body of research called Effective Schools Research has pointed this out. If the student is perceived to be less bright, the predominant mode of interaction is direct teacher talk and it's who, what, when, where. Those are the primary kinds of questions kids get asked. On the other hand, if the perceived ability of the student is high, in addition to some of those questions, students get asked why and how and what if and how might and questions of that ilk. Now think about the intellectual requirements of responding to each of those sets of questions. And again, this is not a value judgment on the questions, because all those are good questions. But who, what, when, where questions force what's called convergent thinking. Somehow you have got that answer. You read it someplace, somebody told it to you, or whatever way you might know. But that's, that forces pulling this one answer, and it's very legitimate. We want students to know some things, very specific information. But that other set of questions elicits a different kind of mental operation. And students can pull from all sorts of things and, and put things together in ways that the first set of questions doesn't allow. Now, in addition to that, it seems that students who are perceived less bright got actually less time in which to formulate an, an answer than the kids who are perceived to be more bright. Are we and should we be about forming the intellect for all of our students? I submit to you the answer is yes. It has to be yes. If it was ever any doubt that the answer should be yes, look at the economic and security implications of not adequately educating all of our citizens to a high level of rigor. That's my challenge. I submit it's your challenge. And together, I think it's doable to meet that challenge. Thank you.